single greatest witch hunt of all time. My message is simple. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how much money you think you may have, no one is above the law. It's the $250 million fraud trial that could bar Donald Trump from doing business in New York. What happened in court today and what it could mean for the former president's own reelection campaign. Plus, que comenzar a ver la vida de diferente manera y va a traer a mi hijo a la escuela y me sentaba en el carro y comenzaba a llorar. They're crushed by media attention when news breaks, but contend with their grief once the cameras are gone. Tonight in our new series, Micro, we look at the lives left behind and report on the first child born with Zika seven years later. And he spent 13 years in the league as one of the NFL's top safeties. Three-time pro bowler and Super Bowl champ Malcolm Jenkins is here to talk about the work he's doing on and off the field. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the latest legal battle involving Donald Trump. The former president and current Republican 2024 frontrunner chose to appear in a lower Manhattan court today for opening statements in New York State's $250 million fraud trial against him. Attorney General Letitia Lee uh, Letitia James had a front row seat. She says the Trump Organization profited for years by intentionally inflating the value of their properties to receive favorable bank rates. In a blow to Trump's defense before the trial began, the judge in the case ruled last week that the Trumps did engage in fraudulent behavior. And while Trump may have sat largely silent inside the courtroom, outside he spoke several times defending his business empire and lashing out at the legal system. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky leads us off tonight from the courthouse. Tonight, former President Trump in court, stone-faced at the defense table for the opening of the civil trial that threatens to shatter the success story at the heart of his brand. New York Attorney General Letitia James in court, too, staring at Trump from her seat in the front row. She's accusing the former president of being a fraud and a liar. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how much money you think you may have, no one is above the law. On the bench, Judge Arthur N. Gorin, who has already dealt Trump a severe blow, ruling he did commit fraud, inflating his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion by overvaluing much of his real estate empire. It could mean Trump will have to give up control of his signature properties in New York. In court today, lawyers for the state arguing Trump lied year after year, and they had the receipts. Take the Trump Tower penthouse. The state says the Trump organization inflated its value by some $200 million, declaring it was 30,000 square feet. But the attorney general's team showed Trump's signature on a document certifying the apartment is actually a third that size, 11,000 square feet. And while Trump said Mar-a-Lago was worth up to $600 million, the state contends its assessed value is actually no more than $27 million. And they played video from the deposition of Trump's former lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen, who says he and former chief financial officer Alan Weisselberg artificially boosted the value of certain properties at Trump's direction if, say, he wanted to move up on the Forbes list of the wealthiest people. Mr. Trump would call Alan and I into the office and let's say it said he was worth six billion dollars well he wanted to be higher on the forbes list and he then said i'm actually not worth six billion i'm worth seven in fact i think it's actually now worth eight with everything that's going on alan and i were tasked with taking the assets increasing each of those asset classes in order to accommodate that eight billion dollar number Trump's lawyers said real estate values, even square footage, are subjective, and the Trump properties are Mona Lisa properties, suggesting they're priceless. Throughout opening statements, Trump sitting with his arms crossed, shaking his head. He sometimes muttered under his breath, often whispering with his attorneys. He wasn't required to be in court today, but he came anyway, and several times spoke to reporters in the hallway, attacking Attorney General James and Judge Ngoran. Trump was given the option of a jury trial, but his lawyers didn't take it, and now his fate is in the hands of the judge. This is a judge that should be disbarred. This is a judge that should be out of office. Using familiar language from the Trump playbook. So very simply put, it's a witch hunt. It's a disgrace. He's calling this one the greatest witch hunt of all time. Let's get right to Aaron Katursky outside the courthouse. Aaron, what's at stake here for the former president? 
There's already a very real possibility Trump is going to lose control of the business empire that propelled him to the White House. And the state is now asking the judge to impose a $250 million penalty. The attorney general's office argues Trump inflated his net worth in order to get better terms from banks and insurance companies, something you and I can't do. And so the attorney general's office says the former president shouldn't be allowed to do it either. Lindsay? Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you. For more now, I'd like to welcome back Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor in the South District of New York who fought against fraud cases. Khan, thanks so much for coming on the show as usual. Let's talk about what Americans saw today. You have a former American president in the same courtroom as the attorney general who's investigated him and the judge who's going to rule on the case. What's your takeaway on day one? My takeaway, three of them. One, I think the fact that the former president came to be present at the first day of his trial, of this trial, the civil trial, shows he knows how serious mm. it is. Uh, that's number one. The other two things I'd say are that these were not, this was not a good day for the former president. It hasn't been a good week. And the reason for that are two things. One, when you're a defendant, whether a civil defendant or a criminal defendant, you have to speak through your lawyer. And I am certain that it was difficult for the former president to allow his lawyers to do their job um, in that room with the judge, the fact finder, with his adversary, uh, Attorney General Tish James on the other side. And number three, he's behind on the pitch count. He already knows that the fact finder, the judge, has already ruled against him. So he's behind, and I think it's a, it was a bad day for him. That judge has ruled that Trump engaged in repeated fraud. What does that mean? It basically eviscerates a lot of the case and defense for uh, former president, uh, his company, and his children who have been charged as well in, in the case. So what that means is that a lot of this trial, which is going to last two, two months at least, is going to be about damages, and it's going to be about the other claims that the judge did not decide on, the claims about insurance fraud, for instance. We saw that video there of Trump speaking in the hallway. Were you surprised that he spoke out? I wasn't surprised, <laughs> um, because that seems to be a, a calculated risk that the former president is taking. Um, most defense lawyers would tell their clients, don't say anything. Um, and especially for the former president, it's risky because he has all these other cases out there pending against him. So he knows anything he says. Those other prosecutors, guess what? They're listening. And in that moment, he's slamming the attorney general and the judge. I mean, how much of a risk is that for him? It's a big risk. Uh, you know, he's facing a potential gag order in one of the cases because of these very statements that he's been making. I'll tell you this, I am sure his lawyers are telling him, please, please, Mr. President, don't do this. Do you expect Trump to testify? I do not. I, I don't think there's any upside for him. He's already testified in a deposition format in this case. I, I think for him, there really is no upside in getting up on that stand. Is this a slam dunk case? I think... Given the judge's ruling, uh, it is for now. Um, it will go up on appeal, I am sure. Con Nowaday, always appreciate your time and analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Now to Capitol Hill, where this weekend Congress narrowly avoided a government shutdown, but it could prove costly after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy had to rely on Democratic votes to secure the last-minute deal. And that's led to a threat by fellow Republican Matt Gates to try to oust him as the GOP leader. So is McCarthy's speakership in doubt? We have team coverage tonight from Capitol Hill and begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Do you think your job is in jeopardy? Tonight, after cutting a deal with Democrats and a large number of moderate Republicans to prevent a government shutdown, Kevin McCarthy facing threats from members of his own party. Recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. It is becoming increasingly clear who the Speaker of the House already works for, and it's not the Republican conference. Florida Congressman Matt Gates vowing to force a vote this week to remove McCarthy as Speaker. Speaker, are you confident you can survive this? It would take as few as five Republican votes to remove McCarthy. The big question, would Democrats step in to bail him out? Speaker McCarthy said he will survive this. Should he be that confident? Well, he's probably right. If Kevin McCarthy works for Democrats and utilizes Democrats in order to keep power, that would be consistent with everything we've seen from him. After failing to win over the far right wing of his party, McCarthy suddenly dropped his demands and worked with Democrats on a short-term solution to keep the government funded until November 17th. Democrats agreed to strip out additional funding for Ukraine, 
But President Biden says McCarthy assured him the money would be approved separately. I hope my friends on the other side keep their word about support for Ukraine. They said they're going to support Ukraine in a separate vote. Gates pounced. So, Mr. Speaker, just tell us, just tell us, what was in the secret Ukraine side deal? And late today, McCarthy insisting he did not make a deal with the president. Gates says that there was a deal made on Ukraine. Really? What is By he who? talking about? I that's have what, no that's idea. What and the president he, said something similar to that. No. That there, was there a deal at all? You, you weren't there. There is no side deal going forward. All right, now I want to go to Rachel. Scott, Rachel, I know there are a lot of moving parts right there at the Capitol. What's the latest as far as Speaker McCarthy and Matt Gates? Yeah, well, I'm looking at my producer right now who has been monitoring the floor, and we have just learned that Congressman Matt Gates has officially made good on those threats. He has moved forward with the first step to try to remove Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy from his job. And so far, he is getting some support. We can tell you that on our list, we have four Republicans who would support the so-called motion to vacate, this move that would remove Kevin McCarthy uh, from his speakership. At this point, it's unclear when they'll go forward with the actual vote, and I just want to make these numbers very clear for everyone again. If all Democrats uh, vote to kick McCarthy out of speakership, then all that would be needed would be five Republicans to support that move, Lindsay. Any indication that uh, he has the full support of Democrats? Right now, that is the big question. What will Democrats do? Will Democrats try to help Speaker Kevin McCarthy? Will they try to bail him out? I've certainly talked to some Democratic members who say they are looking to leader Hakeem Jeffries to decide how they should move forward on this. Is there some type of deal that they can make with Speaker McCarthy so that he can remain in the Speaker's office? Others point out that this is a Speaker that has launched an impeachment inquiry into President Biden who has blocked their, their priorities, and they have made it clear they're not interested in helping him this time around, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott, I know we'll be talking to you a lot in the coming hours and, and days. Thank you so much for your reporting as always. Now I want to bring in Jay O'Brien, uh, who's also on the Hill. Uh, Jay, we knew that from the very beginning, uh, Speaker of the House uh, Kevin McCarthy got the job by a razor thin margin. Give us the latest of where things stand tonight. Yeah, Lindsay, so uh, let me walk you through a little bit of what you just saw on the House floor. And it was a bit of an anticlimax because Matt Gates has been hyping up this motion to vacate for weeks and months. He publicized that he was going to the floor this afternoon in which he gave a speech about Ukraine funding and criticized, as you heard in Rachel's piece, Speaker McCarthy for, as Gates put it, cutting a deal with President Biden. That's a deal that Speaker McCarthy denies. And then, of course, we don't hear anything from Gates over the course of the day and then right as this vote is going on as the house is voting we start to get rumblings from sources that Matt Gates is going to give a floor speech and he did exactly what you just saw a little bit of and a little bit of what Rachel just described which is Gates goes out to the well of the house and he just introduces that motion to vacate against McCarthy and then that was it next steps here are they have to schedule that vote on the motion to vacate, it would likely come two legislative days from now, so not tonight, but in the near future. Gates signaled that he was preparing for that earlier today. Uh, let's take you back all the way, Lindsay, to the speaker fight in which you and I were on the air together for hours and hours and hours because that is what brought us to today. McCarthy made a concession to become speaker, to lower the threshold of the number of members who could call for a motion to oust him to one. That was a big concession he made to get into his current job. And that is what Matt Gates just did. Called him on it, used that motion to vacate, and now both sides are going to try to figure out what kind of support they have to boot McCarthy, or if you're McCarthy, to stay in that job. All right, all really fascinating. And I know it's all developing and unfolding as we speak in real time. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you as always. Heartbreaking news in Philadelphia, where a freelance journalist and former city employee was shot and killed early this morning. Local officials arrived at Josh Kruger's home around 1.30 a.m., where they found him shot seven times in the chest and abdomen. He was taken to a local medical center, where he was then pronounced dead. Kruger was openly queer and was currently working as a freelance reporter and previously employed by the Philadelphia City Paper and Philadelphia Weekly. No arrest or weapon has been recovered at this time. And we 
turn next to the investigation of a tragic emergency at a home-based daycare in California where several children fell into a swimming pool. Three of them were taken to the hospital, with two of them later pronounced dead. Here's ABC's Zareen Shah. Tonight, the San Jose Police Homicide Unit and the Santa Clara County DA's office are investigating the deaths of two children after they fell into a pool at this daycare. It happened around 9 a.m. local time at the Happy Happy Daycare based out of a residence. From above, you can see the pool in the backyard surrounded by a tall protective fence. We have three patients all together. Um, two are going to be immediate. I need two more ambulances. There were reportedly five children at the daycare at the time. Ambulances rushing three to the hospital in critical condition. Two of the children later pronounced dead. The third child expected to survive. And Lindsay, police say they will be on the scene for a significant amount of time as they investigate with the DA's office. Lindsay. Zoreen, thank you. California Governor Gavin Newsom has tapped LaFonza Butler as the interim pick to fill the late Senator Dianne Feinstein seat. Newsom pledged to fill the Senate vacancy with a black woman. Butler was previously an advisor to Vice President Kamala Harris during her 2020 presidential campaign. If appointed senator, Butler will become the first openly black lesbian to serve in the position in the history of the United States. Newsom called the former advisor a fighter, and she will, quote, represent us proudly. A warning tonight from actor Tom Hanks about the dangers of artificial intelligence. He says that a video circulating that appears to be of him promoting a dental plan is a fake. Here's Arcana Whitworth. Tonight, one of Hollywood's most beloved stars warning against the dangers of artificial intelligence. Tom Hanks sharing this on Instagram, writing, Beware, there's a video out there promoting some dental plan with an AI version of me. I have nothing to do with it. The actor seeking to protect his fans from being duped by the power of technology when videos, likenesses, even voices can be manipulated by AI. The use of artificially generated images in the entertainment industry, one of the core issues at the heart of the SAG after strike, actors seeking protection against their image being used without their consent. Hanks cautioning against artificial intelligence in a recent interview. Outside of the understanding that has been done with AI or deep fake, there'll be nothing to tell you that it's not me and, uh, and me alone. And Lindsay, you know, Hanks is really just the latest person to discuss the dangers that AI can pose. This as lawmakers are trying to figure out how to regulate it and protect consumers. Lindsay? Kena, thank you. Still much more to get to tonight here on Prime. New fallout from a police raid at a newspaper and at the home of the publisher who's now being suspended from their job. But next, our new series, Micro, following what happens to people at the center of a major headline after the cameras are all gone. One family tells us how the Zika virus left a lasting impact on their family. Que nos cambia la vida de 180 grados y donde tenemos que que comenzar a ver la vida de diferente manera y va a traer a mi hijo a la escuela y me sentaba en el carro y comenzaba a llorar. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. When news breaks, camera crews descend, reporters and producers converge, and those at the center of the story are bombarded. After that initial crush of media attention, cameras pack up, the reporters leave the scene, but the subject of the news themselves continue to grapple with their grief as the world moves on. And that's the focus of our new series, Micro. In this first installment, we bring you the story of Claudia Funes and her husband, Christian Hiron, who came to America and whose daughter, Dara, was the first Zika-affected child born in the U.S. Seven years later, we show the struggles and everyday joys of this family as they still reel from the impact of Zika. Son los que estamos aquí eh, celebrando la vida de Dara. Cada año, cada día nos enseña cosas nuevas. Estamos un año a la vez siempre pues viendo que, que sobrepasa las expectativas, que ella está bien, que puede estar sana y que, y que va creciendo. Claro, siempre es como la ilusión de que si tenemos el varón, pues queremos la niña. Me casé. Tuve a mi hijo mayor, a David Andrés, porque teníamos una vida en Honduras, una vida que, que era relativamente cómoda, teníamos muy buenos empleos. Donde se manejaba toda la parte de marketing y el personal. Aba y daba clases en la universidad también. Entonces estábamos pues estables y todo iba bien. Y... En el 2015 comienza todo lo, de, lo del virus. Brazil, the epicenter for the Zika virus epidemic. The country grappling with the devastating effects it has on babies of infected women. Pero pues lo veíamos tan largo porque nosotros vivimos en Centroamérica. A call for the Summer Olympics in Brazil to be canceled or postponed because of Zika. The recent cluster reported in Latin America constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. Y salgo embarazada de Dara. En el primer trimestre, eh, pues todo iba bien, solo que un día Cris eh, comenzó con muchos síntomas, ojos rojos, fiebres altas, dolor de cuerpo, escalofríos. Comienzo yo también con una alergia en el cuerpo, pero solo era la alergia. Ya se declaró la emergencia también en Honduras, pero ahora, además de la declaración de emergencia, necesitamos actuar. Ese fue el día que que me dio el Zika, tenía exactamente ocho semanas de embarazo. Ahí fue donde ese virus me afectó a, a dar. Porque nos cambia la vida de 180 grados y donde tenemos que, que comenzar a ver la vida de diferente manera. Iba a traer a mi hijo a la escuela y me sentaba en el carro y comenzaba a llorar. Porque no entendía cómo había, me había pasado eso y cómo mi hija se había afectado. Entonces me dijo, creo que él, eh, tenemos que dejar nuestra comodidad por la comodidad de ella. Y Dara nació a las 3 y 5 de la tarde el 31 de mayo. Tenía 35 semanas. Tonight, doctors in New Jersey are revealing new details about that first Zika-affected baby born in the continental U.S. Doctors saying today the mother was infected in Honduras and came to the U.S. just last week for better care. The baby girl that was born to the mother with Zika infection is currently being evaluated for complications related to congenital Zika. Dara nació así por el virus del Zika. El cráneo no crece y su cerebro está, compri está como comprimido por su cabeza, por eso es chiquitita. Pero tocó su visión, donde Dara no, no puede ver, ni aunque se le pongan lentes. Mucho, así que tiene 30% menos de audición en, un oído, en el, su oído derecho. Tiene más 
daño cerebral en su parte, en su cerebro izquierdo, en el lado izquierdo de su cerebro. Y es lo que este virus vino. Green pepper, cilantro, asparagus. Es pues, atrasado porque tiene siete años y todavía come puré. No podemos darle sólido. ¿Qué pasó? The first time when, when she laughed was when uh, I made a cow sound. You know? Mm. Mm. The same, the same reaction six years ago. Mm. pero tal vez no tienen los materiales ni los tratamientos como el que Dara recibió porque no existen. Por ejemplo, los niños con discapacidad en Honduras no tienen derecho a una escuela. ¿no? Por ser una persona con discapacidad, no tiene seguro. Descartada al 100. Deja la puerta abierta. ¿Esta también? Sí, para que ya André va a entrar. ¿Me lo da Sí. André también pues, se va a beneficiar de todo este cambio que para él fue pues un poco más difícil. Déjame aportar el que... Dame lo que sea, mi mamá. También fue difícil para él adaptarse a otra cultura, venir a, a las escuelas. Nosotros no venimos a, a quitarle nada a nadie, ni, ni abusar de un sistema, ni nada de eso. Solo queremos que Dara tenga una mejor que la vida de vida. Que, que pueda ser feliz, eso es lo único que quiero. Sí, porque no se la ve. Entonces, estamos ahorita trabajando con el láser, con alimentación. Esta es una terapia que ayuda a regenerar las células. Esto hace que muchos niños que tienen problemas eh, cerebrales eh, tengan una pubertad eh, más temprana. De lo... Muy bien, Dara. Y bien, Dara. Y Dara, pues apenas va a cumplir siete y ya comenzó con esto. Ya, solo es suavecito. Okay, sí. Cada uno de estos implementos que ustedes que ven no las cubre el seguro, lo hemos intentado. Nosotros hacemos campañas de recaudación de fondos, vendemos camisetas, eh, hacemos sorteos, hacemos muchas actividades y así es que podemos adquirirlo. Sí está cansada, sí está cansada, sí, yo la entiendo, ¿ok? El ver niñas de la edad de Dara y verlas que van a la escuela con sus uniformes, platicando con sus papás, sí, yo no puedo. No llevar a mi hija de la mano, que me diga que qué muñeca quiere o qué dibujito es el preferido de ella. Es difícil ver a otras niñas y, y solo me imagino a mi hija que tal vez estuviera haciendo eso. ¿Ese es agua? Sí. ¿O es el, el agua? Ok. Sí, sí ha sido difícil. Han sido siete años que no han sido fáciles, donde he llorado, donde me he deprimido. El dolor siempre existe porque es una herida que nunca se sana. Jamás se va a sanar. Y, pero sí como que no es forrarnos al dolor, sino que a la oportunidad, a ver la alegría, a ver cómo puedo sacar a dar adelante. Pero más más ocupadas. Mis 23 horas y media son de ellos y los otros, los, tengo una media hora, por ejemplo, que puedo tomar un tiempo más para bañarme. Eh, leo un libro, pero leo dos páginas diarias, que es lo que me permito. Ya hoy, este año, me quiero emprender, trabajar desde mi casa. Quiero ayudar a otras familias que pasan por lo mismo que yo he pasado. Eh, antes, Dara, antes de nacer, eh, los doctores habían hecho ultrasonido y decían que solo pesaba tres libras, que tal vez no iba a vivir, que estuviéramos preparados para eso, pero aquí estamos siete años después agradecidos por la vida de ella, por tenerla.
still finding those moments to celebrate. And we still have much more to get to. Coming up, he served as former President Trump's vice president for four years, but Mike Pence says he's well known, but not known well. We get to know the former vice president in our new series, Who Is, and how he hopes his life story will ultimately help him win the presidency. I'm gonna work my heart out to take all those values and those principles and uh, earn the right to carry them uh, into 2024 and hopefully to the White House. But next, millions of Americans will be tightening their belts once again. Student loan payments resume. We take a closer look at life after the pandemic pause by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, yeah. every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The turning of the calendar page this month is a rude awakening for millions of Americans paying back student loans. We take a closer look by the numbers. 45 million people in the U.S. currently have federal student loan debt at an average of $37,338 a borrower. That adds up to a whopping $1.6 trillion owed. It's been more than three years since former President Donald Trump first hit pause on student loans as the pandemic took hold. The Biden-Harris administration continued the policy extending 
extending the grace period eight times. President Biden even took his attempt to forgive at least $10,000 in debts all the way to the Supreme Court, where he lost. Interest resumed last month, and now after a 42-month hiatus, the first bills are coming due. With inflation still up 4.3% year over year, it's another cost to contend with. And economists fear consumer spending could take a hit. We should note there is a 12-month on-ramp period that will allow you to miss a payment without seeing your credit score suffer. And you may be eligible for some relief. The White House SAVE plan ties loan repayment to income and could save certain borrowers roughly $1,000 a year. In some cases, it will actually zero out repayments. We know this is a complicated topic and one that many have been dreading. You can learn more about your federal student loan repayment options at studentaid.gov. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime. He's a three-time pro bowler and two-time Super Bowl champion. Malcolm Jenkins tells us why he's now revealing what winners won't tell you. And her world tour may have just come to an end, but Beyonce is not taking a break. She reveals the next project in her renaissance era. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The news-making interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Welcome back. We turn now to the dramatic rescue of a nine-year-old girl who'd been missing since Saturday evening tonight, found alive. The young girl vanished while camping with her family in upstate New York. Police said that they had believed she had been taken. The New York governor called it every parent's nightmare. Let's go now to ABC Stephanie Ramos for the latest. Hi there, Lindsay. I'm standing outside the Morrill Lake State Park. You can see that they've just put a sign behind me that says road closed. State troopers are still there. We learned from New York State Police tonight that, as you mentioned, nine-year-old Charlotte Senna was found alive and in good condition tonight. Just a few moments before we got that confirmation, we saw her family arrive here at the park, and then moments later, they came out to thank everyone who assisted in this massive search multiple agencies involved in this search more than 400 people combing this area trying to find that little girl who disappeared while riding her bike in this area around the park just north of Albany here in New York but tonight she has been found alive and police say she is in good health and also Lindsay a suspect is in custody Lindsay I know authorities had said all weekend that they believe she was in imminent danger after this exhaustive search so what a miraculous outcome Stephanie Ramos, thank you so much for your reporting. New developments for a police department that raided a newspaper. The investigation into the killing of a man known for exposing child predators. And Beyonce closes out her world tour with a major announcement about her next step. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. A Kansas police chief is suspended from the job after a raid at a local newspaper. Chief Gideon Cody initially justified the raid on the Marion County record and the seizure of computers and cell phones, saying that he was acting on allegations that the paper had used private information about a story on a local business owner. County officials later withdrew the warrants, and now the city has suspended Chief Cody without comment. The newspaper reports that it's obtained body-worn camera footage from the day of the raid that suggests Cody was looking for reporters' notes about him. Hollywood writers and late-night shows are back to work, but actors are still on strike and are expected to resume negotiations with top studios over a new contract. The Screen Actors Guild represents about 160,000 people and began striking in July along with the Writers Guild. The Actors Guild is pushing for higher residual payments from successful shows and clearer guidelines on the use of artificial intelligence for on-screen work. Robert Lee, known as Bupak Shakur on social media, was a child predator vigilante. He posed as an underage girl to catch sexual predators. The conversations that he had with them would then be forwarded to police. And sometimes Lee himself would confront the would-be predators and even recording those interactions and then posting them on social media. Lee was killed late Friday night inside Universal Coney Island near North Perry and MLK Boulevard in Pontiac. The Sheriff's Department says Lee confronted two men, ages 17 and 18, inside the restaurant, even accusing one of the men of being a pedophile. Police arrested the two men involved in Lee's shooting on Saturday. The names of the men have not been released because formal charges have not been filed. Two University of Pennsylvania scientists, Dr. Drew Weissman and Dr. Catalin Carrico, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Their discoveries led to the creation of the mRNA vaccines that protect against COVID. Before COVID, mRNA was tested on diseases like Zika and rabies. Now, after the commercial and medical success of the mRNA COVID vaccines, scientists are trying to use mRNA to help alleviate allergies and possibly even cure cancer. 13-year-old Davian Kimbrough made history this weekend in the United Soccer League, becoming the youngest professional athlete in American team sports. Kimbrough was brought on as a substitute in the 87th minute of the Sacramento Republic's 2-0 victory against the Las Vegas Knights. The teenager grew up in Sacramento and was a star on the Republic's youth team before getting the call to play for the main squad. Big B. The B stands for box office. Time Grammy winner confirming that a concert film of her record-breaking Renaissance World Tour is anticipated to hit theaters December 1st in a deal with movie chain giant AMC. The hugely successful platinum album Renaissance making way for the highest grossing tour by a solo female artist. Renaissance raking in a reported $450 million and generating an estimated $4.5 
$1.5 billion for the U.S. economy. Movie theaters looking to cash in at a time of slumping ticket sales and as several high-profile films face delays because of the actor strike. You may know him as the conservative politician who served as President Trump's VP for four years, but tonight we are getting to know who is Mike Pence the person. He says he's well known, but not known well. We recently sat down with him in Iowa, where he hopes his personal brand of politics will translate into results. It's the latest in our series, Who Is? Giving viewers a chance to hear from presidential hopefuls. It's especially initial, it's, it's a special initially brought to us by ABC News legends Peter Jennings and Charlie Gibson. Were you conscious as a child and as a young man that you came from a life of privilege? So did you think to yourself, Barack, what kind of hubris is this? Being president. And they said, be a man. <laughs> yeah, they said, be a man. They said, we're not accepting girls. But you're a Mormon kid. No drinking, no smoking. Growing up as a child, what did you think you wanted to be? I've heard you say before that you're a Christian, a conservative, and Republican in that order. Mm -hmm. If I could get you to just elaborate with a few more words, who is Mike Pence? Well, I, I, I can't say it much more succinctly than that. I mean, my faith is the most important thing in my life. My family is everything to me. But my values are the principles that have always made this country as strong and prosperous and made America everything that it's been before. And, but I'm also a proud Republican. I believe the Republican Party holds the keys today to really restore our country, to put our economy back on a path of prosperity, and also to have America standing tall in the world as the leader of the free world. And uh, I'm going to work my heart out to take all those values and those principles and uh, earn the right to carry them uh, into 2024 and hopefully to the White House. There was an editor of your hometown paper who said that Mike Pence wanted to be president practically since he popped out of the womb. Uh, <laughs> when did you first know that, that you had this calling or desire? Well, I, you know, I didn't grow up in a political family. My father was a combat veteran. My grandfather was an immigrant. My dad ran a small business. As a young man, I was deeply inspired by the life and example of the late President John F. Kennedy and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It was their example that, that drew me to early activism in the Dem Democratic Party. What made you switch teams? Well, it was just the voice and the values of the 40th president of the United States. And Ronald Reagan, who also grew up in the Midwest. I can't tell you how terrific it feels to get out of Washington and to be here with you. I heard uh, the strength of a commitment to those timeless American ideals, but I also heard the way he spoke about them, always with gentleness and respect, even with people that would differ with him. I knew that uh, uh, the Republican Party uh, was my future, and I joined the Reagan Revolution and never looked back. Your greatest strength? My family. Greatest weakness? Impatience. Fairest criticism of you? Um, I tend to expect too much. He says his faith is not just the foundation of his family and his core beliefs, but it also informs many of his policies, from his stance on gay marriage to abortion. And I couldn't be more proud to be part of an administration that has stood strong, stood without apology for the sanctity of human life. Tell me about the, uh, the, the Christian concert that you went to in Kentucky early on. And <laughs> imagine you would think changed your life did. I found my way uh, along with a small group of college students to Asbury University where there was a Christian music festival taking place where there was some of the early contemporary Christian bands were performing and in between them there was preaching and, and it was as though I, I heard for the first time that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever might believe in him might not perish but have everlasting life. And on a rainy night in 1978, as a freshman in college, I, I, I stood up, um, uh, not just out of a sense of agreement with the truth of the gospel, but because my heart was broken with gratitude for what had been done for me on the cross. And I walked down and I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And it's changed my life forever. We brought in Karen, his wife of 38 years and mother of his three children, to keep Mike honest about their love story. You all remember the first time you met? <laughs> you better believe it. 
<laughs> Tell me about it. Well, I was, uh, I was attending a little Catholic church, actually, just a block away from the Indiana governor's residence, where we would live a long time later. And I saw this beautiful brunette with a guitar uh, up in the worship group. And uh, I followed her out the back of the church that day. And then we walked out of the front of a church a year and a half later. And uh, <laughs> she's been my wife for 38 years and God's greatest blessing in my life. Is it true the first time he called, he didn't say anything and hung up the phone? That's exactly true. How did yes. that happen? Yeah. Well, I was watching my sister's kids, and he was <laughs> calling her to see what the scoop was on me, because uh, I had told him that she attended the same law school that he was at. And I was watching her kids that week, and so I answered. And when he realized it was me on the phone, he hung up. <laughs> Great first impression. <laughs> But I called her right back. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about eight months later, the loaf of bread. Well, we had made, we had made a habit of heading down to uh, uh, Broad Ripple Canal. Uh -huh. It's in the heart of Indianapolis. And um, part of what was supposed to be the old Erie Canal system. And uh, we would feed the ducks uh, and uh, enjoy some conversation and some time. And so uh, I hollowed out the end of... Uh, of a loaf of French bread um, on one and on the other. And I, hit a, I hit a bottle of champagne in, in one of the loaves and uh, a ring box <laughs> in the top. And uh, she opened up, uh, as, she, as she broke the bread, the ring popped out. And uh, I dropped down on one knee with the traffic whizzing by and uh, asked her to be my wife at that park bench. Kind of romantic. Very romantic. He is a romantic. <laughs> They say they still pray together and view the presidency not as a goal, but a calling placed on his heart by God. You have a favorite scripture? Over the mantle in my study in Indiana, and it's Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. It's very much been our, our family's lodestar, but I also believe uh, it's part of how we bring this country back. If people of faith will simply turn their hearts back to Him, renew their faith in Him, I know that America's will again renew its hope and find a boundless future for all the American people. Our thanks to Mike Pence for that conversation. He spent 13 years in the league as one of the NFL's top safeties. Along the way, Malcolm Jenkins was a three-time Pro Bowler and two-time Super Bowl champion, but he also has made an impact off the field. Jenkins remains a champion of social justice, and his activism can be seen in his work with the Malcolm Jenkins Foundation. We are happy to be joined in studio by the NFL standout himself, who now has a new book out, What the Winners Won't Tell You. Malcolm, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I want to just start right out with the title. What won't winners tell you? <laughs> <laughs> you got to read the book to see the whole thing. It's not a step-by-step, -step, you know, thing, but it's definitely one of those things. When we see winners and people who are successful, we usually see the end product, mm -hmm. and there seems to be a gap between us and them, but what we don't really realize is there's a process mm -hmm. to that success. There's things that they had to learn along the way and evolution that had to take place and many losses that they've learned from. And so for me, this is an opportunity to kind of unveil the, the inner workings of you know, my 13 year career and show people exactly what made me me. You retired in 2022, didn't waste any time. What made you decide, I want to walk through these parts. I, I need to write all this down. Yeah, I actually started writing it while I was still playing. Mm -hmm. That last year, I could just tell that, you know, it was getting to the end of the road in my career. And as an athlete, so much, so much is written about you. So many th people say things about you and rarely do we get to tell our own stories. Uh, and so it was a little therapeutic for me to go back through all of these games, all of these your situations and connect the dots between, you know, what people see today and those moments that made me who I was, the people who've influenced me along the way and those experiences that have shaped who I am. Uh, but you don't just talk about those 13 years in the NFL. You no. actually take us all the way back to kindergarten, learning yeah. the lyrics of Lift Every Voice and Sing, yeah. uh, Ohio State becoming a Q, Omega yeah. Sci-Fi. Uh, and, and I'm just curious why you decided, you know what, I'm going to take it way back. Because that's the part that people don't see, right? You know, it's, we've all watched the Super Bowls and, and things like that, but what you don't see is what led up to those moments, those moments where, you know, my grandmother pushes me outside and tells me to fight for myself, right? That's why you see me as, as a person who's constantly using his voice and defending his people in his neighborhood. Those lessons were put into me early. 
Uh, you also talk us through your football career, obviously, from Ohio State, the Saints, the Eagles. And not only that, but winning Super Bowls against arguably the best NFL quarterbacks of all time, Peyton Manning and, and Tom Brady. When you look back, what do you make of it all? You know, I, I look every day now, and I'm watching each week how many, you know, nights a week that football dominates the prime time, yeah. right? How how we as a society wrap ourselves around this game, and I'm I'm almost taken aback to know that I was standing sitting stage mm. at that stage, you know, and, and and being a part of it. So I'm extremely grateful. But you also write about your leadership and your involvement in the peaceful protests in the locker room. And you write normally before games, I didn't notice the crowd. It was like white noise and vibrations mostly. But this night on primetime football Monday night, I felt like the world was watching as we went through our normal game day routine and took to the field. This time felt anything but normal. You were one of the first players to start that NFL group chat about the. Play players needing to do something. Take us back to that moment. Yeah, you know, Colin Kaepernick started something when he took a knee, right? It, it a conversation was birthed out of sports and went around the world where you had young people and activists coming together trying to figure out what to do. And I realized that that wasn't just like a flash moment. This was something, this is an opportunity. And so we began to try to organize, which I learned was a very difficult thing to do. But what we got out of it was the Players Coalition. And, and what started with a group of about a dozen players is now expanded to uh, represent players in over a dozen uh, professional sports leagues doing work all over the country. I just want to go back to a point you made earlier. You saw, talked about suffering from anxiety. I think a lot of people are going to look at you and your career and say, what, not Malcolm yeah. Jenkins. How did you cope with that? Uh, I didn't cope with it very well at first, you know, because I tried to compartmentalize it. I had the same thoughts as, as what you just said. Like, well, come on, you have everything. You shouldn't feel this way, but anxiety doesn't really, <laughs> <Discriminate>, <laughs> doesn't right. really work like that. <laughs> Um, and so I struggled, you know, and, and it got to the point where it was so bad that I, I had to ask for help. I was scared. And uh, that's something I don't do often. And so I share that because it was one of my most vulnerable moments. Um, but asking for help led me into understanding myself a little bit more, understanding my role as a leader, what I could handle, what I couldn't, what was my responsibility and what wasn't. Uh, and what I could do, I, you know, I, I should do, but what I can't is... I have to be okay with, you know, not. And I think that's something that we all struggle with, right? It's trying to be everything for everyone, and that's just really not the reality. Malcolm, so good to talk with you Thank and you. have you on the show. Really appreciate your time. Want our viewers to know that his new book, What Winners Won't Tell You, is now available wherever books are sold. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Up in the next hour, there's an increasingly contentious battle on Capitol Hill over funding for Ukraine, what well, the Pentagon is saying as Ukrainians worry about future aid. And a possible solution to help curb the dangerous and deadly gun violence in Haiti, the action the UN Security Council is now taking. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen, ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I think vulnerability is extremely powerful. This is an artist that I looked up to at one point. I never would have imagined that the ending would have been what it was. They do not shock me. The treatment was just so disgusting on everyone's part. Did Lizzo ever put her hands on you? No, she didn't get to that point. She attempted to come at me with her fist balled up. Lizzo is denying it all. Lizzo's legal limbo. You never, like, expect for it to turn into that. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to this evening, including the fraud trial that could bar Donald Trump from doing business in New York. What happened in court today and the late news about what we can expect tomorrow as the trial continues. And a new warning from the Pentagon after Congress stripped money for Ukraine from the deal to keep the government open and a deadly end to a church service after a roof collapses. Now there's an urgent search through the rubble for dozens of missing worshipers. But we do begin with late developments on Capitol Hill and a major step in attempts by some House Republicans to replace Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Florida Congressman Matt Gates appearing on the House floor to offer his motion to vacate the Speaker's chair. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Clause 2A1 of Rule 9, I rise to give notice of my intent to raise a question of the privileges of the House. Declaring the office of Speaker of the House of Representatives to be vacant. Resolved that the office of Speaker of the House of Representatives is hereby declared to be vacant. The move sets up a showdown over McCarthy's leadership and follows a last-minute deal to avoid a government shutdown that relied on Democratic votes. Speaker McCarthy already responded by simply saying, bring it on. So will Gates get any traction? We have team coverage tonight from Capitol Hill. But we begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, who just spoke with Matt Gates. And before we hear what he had to say, just give us the latest, Rachel, on what's unfolded tonight in this effort to remove House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Another chaotic week is beginning here on Capitol Hill, Lindsay, and I can tell you what we just witnessed on the House floor was history. No member has brought a motion to vacate to the floor to try to oust the Speaker of the House in 100 years. We are watching a once in a century fight once again here on Capitol Hill. All of this comes after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy made a deal with Democrats, working with them and moderate Republicans to keep the government open and funded. He tried again and again to try to satisfy the far right wing of his conference it was never enough. So frustrations boiling over here on Capitol Hill. Congressman Matt Gates finally making good on those threats, moving forward with this effort to try to oust him. Now, this is just the first step. What we're going to see next is a vote to either table the motion, to simply 
immediately put it aside or to bring it to the floor for a vote where McCarthy's speakership will be on the line. All of this comes down to numbers. This is a game of math, okay? So if all Democrats vote in support of kicking McCarthy out of the speaker's office, then Matt Gates only needs four other Republicans to join him, a total of five. And right now I could tell you we've been out here on Capitol Hill. We've been here on the steps. We've already talked to at least four Republicans who say they do support this effort to kick out Kevin McCarthy from the speaker's office, Lindsay. Oh, four and plus one Matt Gates equals five. Four, including Matt Gates so I far. See. So they're looking for one other. And, and I can tell you that we have been talking to some, some Republicans that we know were frustrated with that deal that Kevin McCarthy made with Democrats who are on the fence. I can tell you Congresswoman Nancy May said to me that Con uh, that Matt G that uh, Kevin McCarthy has her number and that if he wants her support, he should give her a call. Okay. All right, Rachel. Congressman Gates spoke moments ago. You asked him about his lack of Republican support. Let's listen to that exchange for a moment. So you've made it clear that if this fails, you will try again. How soon would that happen? Well, I'm not so pessimistic as to immediately accept that it'll fail. I think that's the likely outcome. Uh, but, you know, this won't be the only time. That's probably all I'll, all I'll uh, say on that. So what does that mean for how this could all play out in the next 48 hours and beyond? Yeah, it means Gates is relentless at this point. He is committed to this effort. He has made it clear he does not believe that Kevin McCarthy should be the Speaker of the House. So he can bring this motion to try to force this vote to oust Speaker McCarthy, and then it could fail. We could see this fail. And Gates says at some point, he may try again. So there are bigger questions here about the timing of all of this, because you certainly have Republicans who are frustrated with McCarthy, but they do not believe now is the time and the place to be doing this. Remember, this is a short term deal to keep the government funded. We will be revisiting this fight in about 45 days, right before Thanksgiving. And I've talked to a lot of Republicans here on Capitol Hill who say the focus needs to be on that, Lindsay. Yeah, a lot of people think this is a distraction. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you as always. Now I want to bring in ABC's Jay O'Brien who's also on Capitol Hill. Uh, Jay, what are you hearing about McCarthy's strategy here? Uh, how is he going to try to hold on to his job? Well, he's got two tracks to look to hold on to his job here, Lindsay, in theory. One, he's got to talk to Republicans. As Rachel said, it's going to come down to Republican votes. As you alluded to, five is that magic number. Once he loses the fifth Republican, every Republican from number five onwards, he's got to try to offset, in theory, with Democratic votes. And I asked the Speaker earlier today, is he in conversations with Democrats about a potential mo motion to vacate? He told me... He doesn't need them. He's trying to project yeah. this air of confidence. It's unclear what he knows and what votes he thinks he has. But I can tell you, Lindsay, as Rachel just alluded to, I've been talking with what we call the usual suspects, the Republicans who often are a thorn in McCarthy's side who are critical of them. And the line I keep getting back is they're waiting to see. They're waiting to make their mind up. They haven't yet come out fully and saying that they're backing Gates yet. Again, as Rachel said, the number we right now have is four in including Gates, but you've got two days in theory before this vote were to happen. And you were there, of course, the night of the speaker vote. You saw how heated things got, very contentious between McCarthy and Gates, who was resistant to him taking the role of speaker in the first place. What is McCarthy saying about this challenge to his job? We know that he's saying bring it, but uh, what are you hearing about his strategy to really hold on to power? Well, the other thing we're hearing, too, is that this traces, remember, all the way back to the speaker fight. It traces back to a concession that McCarthy made to become the Speaker of the House, in which he lowered the threshold for the number of members it would take for him to be called to be ousted from his job. He lowered that threshold to one. Matt Gates is the one today. By the way, this is Kevin Gart McCarthy's response. Bring it on. Now, it, what we've asked Kevin McCarthy repeatedly is, do you want to change that rule when you ask about his strategy? Do you want to change the rule that creates only a one-person threshold to boot you out of your job because it might infect the workings of the House of Representatives? That's certainly the argument that McCarthy's allies are making. He said he doesn't like the rule, he doesn't view it as productive for the House, but it's unclear what his strategy would be to change it. Right now, he's got to survive this bid to take him out of his job. Very confident, though, with his response, simply bring it on. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you, as always.
Now to the latest legal battle involving Donald Trump. The former president and current Republican 2024 frontrunner chose to appear in a lower Manhattan court today for opening statements in New York State's $250 million fraud trial against him. Attorney General Letitia James had a front row seat to it all. She says the Trump organization profited for years by intentionally inflating the value of their properties to receive favorable bank rates. And while Trump may have kept quiet in front of the judge outside of the courtroom, he spoke several times defending his business empire and lashing out at the legal system. Here's ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. Tonight, former President Trump in court, stone-faced at the defense table for the opening of the civil trial that threatens to shatter the success story at the heart of his brand. New York Attorney General Letitia James in court, too, staring at Trump from her seat in the front row. She's accusing the former president of being a fraud and a liar. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how much money you think you may have, no one is above the law. On the bench, Judge Arthur and Gorin, who has already dealt Trump a severe blow, ruling he did commit fraud, inflating his net worth by as much as $2.2 billion by overvaluing much of his real estate empire. It could mean Trump will have to give up control of his signature properties in New York. In court today, lawyers for the state arguing Trump lied year after year, and they had the receipts. Take the Trump Tower penthouse. The state says the Trump organization inflated its value by some $200 million, declaring it was 30,000 square feet. But the attorney general's team showed Trump's signature on a document certifying the apartment is actually a third that size, 11,000 square feet. And while Trump said Mar-a-Lago was worth up to $600 million, the state contends its assessed value is actually no more than $27 million. And they played video from the deposition of Trump's former lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen, who says he and former chief financial officer Alan Weisselberg artificially boosted the value of certain properties at Trump's direction if, say, he wanted to move up on the Forbes list of the wealthiest people. Mr. Trump would call Alan and I into the office and let's say it said he was worth six billion dollars well he wanted to be higher on the forbes list and he then said i'm actually not worth six billion i'm worth seven in fact i think it's actually now worth eight with everything that's going on alan and i were tasked with taking the assets increasing each of those asset classes in order to accommodate that eight billion dollar number Trump's lawyers said real estate values, even square footage, are subjective, and the Trump properties are Mona Lisa properties, suggesting they're priceless. Throughout opening statements, Trump sitting with his arms crossed, shaking his head. He sometimes muttered under his breath, often whispering with his attorneys. He wasn't required to be in court today, but he came anyway, and several times spoke to reporters in the hallway, attacking Attorney General James and Judge Ngoran. Trump was given the option of a jury trial, but his lawyers didn't take it, and now his fate is in the hands of the judge. This is a judge that should be disbarred. This is a judge that should be out of office. Using familiar language from the Trump playbook. So very simply put, it's a witch hunt. It's a disgrace. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. Now to the war in Ukraine tonight and a new warning from the Pentagon after Congress stripped money for Ukraine from the deal to keep the government running. ABC's Tom Sufi Burge reports from Ukraine. The Pentagon tonight warning that U.S. funding to provide arms and ammunition for the war in Ukraine is running low. Congress avoided a government shutdown in part by stripping $6 billion of funding for the war. Pentagon officials saying existing funds are dwindling to the point where the U.S. has already slowed down resupplying some of its own forces. The demand for weapons and munitions is staggering. New video showing the ferocity of the fight on the war's main southern front. Formidable Russian defences and firepower holding Ukraine back, with casualties mounting. Hospitals full of badly wounded soldiers. Taras losing an arm to an explosive drone after an assault on Russian positions went horribly wrong. Out of seven men in his unit, he believes four did not survive. The enemy's advantage is enormous, he tells us. It's why when our infantry advances, they just die. Lindsay, officials say there is hardly any money left for additional humanitarian and financial aid for Ukraine, but a new military aid package could come as soon as this week using existing funding. Lindsay? 
Tom, thank you. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, he's known as Hollywood royalty, but behind the scenes, his life was not always glamorous. Ed Begley Jr. tells us how his new memoir is revealing his personal struggles. The next, a deadly end to a church service after a roof collapses. Now there's an urgent search through the rubble for dozens of missing worshipers. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from outside the courthouse in Walterboro, South Carolina, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The U.N. Security Council just voted to authorize the deployment of an intervention force in Haiti, first called for a year ago by Haiti's interim leader. The resolution put forward by the U.S. and Ecuador recognizes that the Kenyan government will lead the force, authorizing it to operate for one year with a scheduled review after nine months, according to an advanced copy reviewed by the Associated Press. The force is expected to comprise of less than 1,500 police officers for now the vast majority of whom will come from Kenya alongside contributions from several Caribbean countries. A church roof collapsed during Sunday mass in a northern Mexican city, killing at least nine people and injuring 40, authorities said, with another 30 people still believed to be trapped under the debris. Rescuers and volunteers were seen removing debris, such as wooden pillars with their bare hands as a priest gave instructions, while others raised their fists to call for silence as they tried to hear survivors under the rubble. Authorities in Zimbabwe are still searching for survivors trapped underground when a gold mine that was no longer used collapsed last week as some relatives started to lose hope their loved ones could be saved. Accidents in these mines are common in Zimbabwe where artisanal or small-scale miners defy authorities by mining in old shafts that are prone to collapse. Actor Ed Begley Jr. is Hollywood royalty, son of Oscar-winning actor Ed Begley. Ed has always wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. Begley has been in the industry for 46 years now and still going strong. In his new memoir, To the Temple of Tranquility and Step on It, Ed takes a deep dive into the ups and downs of family, addiction, activism, and redemption. To the Temple of Tranquility and Step on It, where'd you come up with that title? My friend Dick Stahl, a wonderful actor, an actor in TV and films, and on stage as an improv actor. But this one, I'm told, if the story I heard is correct, he said that in real life. He had, like me, been really motivated by the Beatles when they went to see the Maharishi and began pursuing different, you know, philosophical and spiritual paths and what have you. So he made arrangements to go to this ashram somewhere in Indonesia, in some little island somewhere called the Temple of Tranquility. But his flight was late leaving LAX. 
so he missed the flight in Hawaii that was going to the Philippines. And then he didn't get on the merchant marine vessel. He had booked the passage. So when he finally did get there and was much delayed, he ran up the dock, got a little rickshaw, and said to the driver, he said, the Temple of Tranquility and step on it. So I thought that was rather ironic and funny. So I thought it would be a good title, title of the book. You really talk a lot about addiction, failure, redemption. What was it like for you to revisit those experiences of your life? It's been good because a lot of it I've revisited many times over the years, but some I had not. So the keyboard in writing this became like a Ouija board that actually mm -hmm. worked. I started, you know, taking notes for the different chapters in the book just to give to somebody else, to maybe my kids to archive so their kids, my grandkids, could know about my life, my father's life. And something I hadn't thought about in 30, 40 years just came to my mouth and came to the keyboard. Uh, you mentioned your father, uh, Oscar winner Ed Begley. Uh, how did he really shape your life and, and your character? My father was an incredible influence on me, very positive influence, because he was a guy that had made it as a factory worker in his 40s as an actor. He wanted to be an actor his whole life, but it didn't seem to be in the cards for him. So he worked hard and continued to work at a factory in, in Hartford, Connecticut, where he was born, called the Wire Mold Plant. And then he started to work in theater and then finally went to New York, made a career in theater and in radio and finally in films and TV. He was a very successful man in nearly every part of his life. I really loved my father. Tell us about your mom and, and how you learned just going to get your driver's license that the woman you always thought was your mother um, really wasn't your biological mother. It was a big shock, you know, and there was no big father knows best moment uh, involved when I learned it. We had gone to my dad's business manager's office and he had to get that document that you need to get your driver's license, the birth certificate. Hand it to me, I'm writing in the back of the car. I figured I better look at it, see how they wrote these things back in 1949 when I was born. Did they do it with a, a quill and some ink and a, from an ink pot? I mean, how, how, what does this look like? And then I saw on the birth certificate, there's no mother's name. I thought that odd, so I said to my dad who was driving, Dad, mm-hmm. Why is there no mother's name on my birth certificate? And he says, Amanda wasn't your mother. That was a woman I knew to be my mother because she had raised me, passed away when I was seven, and that was mom, only that was not the case. So there was no, hey son, sit down. No, and, no, okay. there was no pulling off the road even, he just kept driving. My dad certainly had his great attributes, but those kind, dealing with those kinds of things was not one of them. So you never asked why they didn't tell you? Why didn't they tell you from the beginning, Sandy's your mom? That's a good question. I, everybody's gone now. I don't really have an answer for that. So you I never asked? I, I never asked. You didn't ask certain questions in my household. I learned that my, my brother Tom was not my brother fairly late in life. My aunt got drunk one day at a party at my house and went over to my brother Tom and said, you know, you're not really my nephew. You're my son. Your dad raised yours and she was drunk and she told him this. He went to my dad and it turned out it was true. I didn't learn that till I was about 25 years old. We were good at keeping secrets. And that's what happens when you numb things with drugs and alcohol. You think things should be kept uh, under lock and key, and maybe they shouldn't. You talk about the, the alcohol and the, and the drugs, and you really credit John Belushi for, for being your savior. He was. And, and, and how so? He and Judy took me out of the uh, conversation pit at the El Presidente Hotel in Durango, Mexico. I was drinking so much I became a source of concern for John Belushi. So I was really a quarter day alcoholic madman and uh, John was quite helpful in me getting sober. So a great comedian and uh, you know I don't like to focus on the, the problems he had in his sadly short life but uh, I had a lot myself and he, he and Judy both helped me with him. How did you end up becoming an environmentalist? I mean, today it's kind of in vogue for people to talk about saving the planet and climate change, global warming, but, but you've been really talking about this for, for decades. Because it was affecting me as a young man. I lived two decades, 20 years in that smoggy air in L.A. After two decades, I said, enough already. What, they're having something called Earth Day? What does that mean? How can I help? And, what are you going to do after that one day? One day is great to celebrate the Earth for one day. What about the other 364? And some of the organizers told me, said, well, what we intend to do is clean up the air in L.A. and clean up the water. And I knew both were true because I'd lived with the smog. It seared my lungs. 
So I got involved in 1970, and we've cleaned up a lot of the waterways. The air is not dirtier, it's cleaner in LA than it was in 1970. Now we still have people that we gotta help today. People live near the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, people near the shipping centers, those fulfillment centers. There's now additional pollution because of those industries. We have to help those people, and I mean today, and we can do it, we've proven that we can do it. What would you like readers to take away from the book, and, and was there anything that, that you learned about yourself as you were writing it? I learned some lessons about addiction. You know, I certainly was addicted not just to drugs and alcohol when I got well in that area, then I had other addictions, gambling and philandering, you know, that were problematic in my life. So I sought help and got well in those areas too. And also, just philosophically, I devote a certain amount of time talking about getting serenity in some f manner in your life. Ed's new book, To the Temple of Tranquility and Step on It, is out tomorrow wherever books are sold. And still to come, amid a breast cancer diagnosis, many patients have to take on another fight, the difficult decisions about their future and families that many women have to make. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Fertility can become a second battle for many women who are already fighting breast cancer. Certain treatments can lead to infertility, giving some of those women yet another difficult set of decisions to make once they're diagnosed. Our Rebecca Jarvis has more. At 38 years old, Sarah Strimmel Bentley, a former Broadway performer turned yoga instructor, was in a new relationship and a picture perfect image of health until she found a lump the size of a walnut in her left breast. I got the biopsy results back that indeed I had stage two invasive ductal carcinoma and it was like time stopped and of course I was terrified. In the same breath, her doctor recommending an appointment with a fertility specialist. I had no idea that when you have breast cancer that, you know, your fertility would be affected. It was my dream. Uh, for as long as I can remember to be a mother. Studies have found that about half of young women with breast cancer say they'd like to have a child after completing the treatment. But some treatments, including certain types of chemotherapy, can affect fertility. We try to be extremely proactive when a young woman is diagnosed with breast cancer about preserving her fertility. Sarah undergoing two rounds of IVF with her then boyfriend James, resulting in a single embryo. I feel so lucky that we have this chance to be able to, to make embryos before I go into treatment. Sarah holding on to hope and her positive spirit through rigorous rounds of surgery, chemo, and radiation. Through it all, her future baby remaining in sight despite the challenges. My oncologist had told me that due to my age, my type of cancer, and the fact that we only had one shot, she said, you need to have a surrogate if you want to bring this baby to life. Sarah and her now husband, James, documenting their surrogacy journey every step of the way. Surrogacy is not a straight line and it is not easy. The Bentleys finally matching with Whitney, their surrogate. Leading up to finding out that the embryo transfer was successful was the longest two weeks of my life. That call 
was either going to be the best day of my life or the hardest news. I lost my mind. The most in incredible moment of my life. Now, the couple are eagerly awaiting the arrival of their baby boy. It's becoming real, and we can't wait to meet the little guy. Just know that if you get diagnosed with breast cancer and you are a young woman and you think your life is over, it is not. I'm so, so thankful to be here. Love her reaction. Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for bringing us that. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line.